So thank you very much for joining uh, the webinar this afternoon with Molten School. Um, I'm just going to start bringing my camera on and uh, hopefully uh, we will be seeing Rob uh, Williams, Helen Wilson and Alex Goodyear and uh, they are populating which is great news. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm just going to uh, pause the video and the music. So uh, good afternoon everybody. How are we? Very well, thank you. Good, thank very you. good, thank you. Great. Um, I uh, very conscious um, and I'm very grateful for your time. Uh, Rob, it's great to see that you're here, Helen and, and Alex. Um, and um, I see that we've still got people joining the room, which is um, really great. Um, and already we've seen that the uh, presentation started a bit earlier. So um, really, um, we wanted to um, take some time uh, to showcase um, what has been a great project and a great journey for, for Moulton. So um, academia has been part of that um, journey with you from the beginning. Um, and um, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to introduce uh, Rob Williams, who's the head teacher at Moulton School. We have uh, Helen Wilson, assistant head teacher, uh, and I guess leads the teaching and learning element. Um, and then we've got Alex Goodyear, who's um, the IT manager for Moulton School. Um, and myself, um, I will uh, do my instruction at the at the end, I guess. So, Rob, um, hi. Hi, hi, Tom. <laughs> How are you? Very good, thank you. Yeah, and thanks yeah. for the opportunity to uh, to talk to everyone today. Yep, and uh, and Rob, just maybe um, just a bit about yourself. You've been at the school probably quite a long time. Just maybe a bit of background about you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I. Uh, Started at Moulton in 2006 as, as head, uh, and uh, uh, previously I was a deputy head in, uh, in Leeds. Uh, so, that you know, I don't know how much you want. You know, people don't want to hear about me. They want yeah. to know about what we've been doing. So I yeah, so we'll, we'll, do, we'll do that shortly. And uh, hi, Helen. Hi. How, uh, how are you doing this afternoon? All good? Good, thank you. Yes. Um, maybe just a bit of background on you as well and, and some history on you and Moulton. Okay, so I've been at the school for about 13 years now, um, started as a main scale teacher and then we created the lead practitioner team and that's led to me um, becoming assistant head teacher with responsibility for teaching and learning and part of my remit has obviously been the deployment of iPads and the integration of those with staff and students. Fantastic and thank you very much and Alex, um, I'm going to say it, where's your purple, sorry, where's your pineapple t-shirt? We were hoping to get a bit of a... Yeah, I was trying to wear some in my headshot this morning, but I decided I would go a little, you know, a little bit more formal. <laughs> Alex, how long have you been at, uh, at Moulton? Uh, yeah, me and Rob actually started on the same day back in 2006 when I was just a, a young man. Um, yeah. Been here the, the whole journey with Rob. Great. And you're, and you're essentially responsible for, for the IT and the infrastructure and, yeah, that's and I guess a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Great. Yeah. Um, I'm Tom Abel Green, known as TAG. Uh, I think if you've been to some of our webinars before, you would have um, seen me. Um, I won't say the same joke, um, but I have got a very long surname. Um, and um, I'm just here to facilitate the conversation. So haven't been involved in the whole of Moulton journey, but certainly over the last three years have been, um, I've, I've gone up to the school several times, worked with the team. Um, and really, um, I think the story is absolutely fantastic. Um, I know Rob didn't want me to say this, um, but we, we should probably um, make people and our listeners aware that um, I know it's a team effort, but I guess in this instance, uh, Rob's been nominated for the equivalent of, of a teaching Oscar um, uh, by, by staff. Um, so, um, you know, we won't make a big deal about it, Rob, but we will bow down to you. Um, and, and I know that you'll say that it is, it is a team effort. So congratulations. Um, moving on, um, we, we were going to kind of look at a set of slides with a timeline, but what we've decided um, is we'll just kind of go to and from. So um, I guess really, um, maybe Rob, you could maybe talk to us a little bit about the the old Molten Way. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, great. So, um, well, just picking up on that brief introduction, just to say that uh, consistency is something that I think we have benefited from. So we've we've had a a consistent team in place uh, for for quite a number of years now, which has has helped us to on this journey. So just to say that as a starting point. Um, but the old Moulton Way, briefly, was was I think quite traditional in terms of teaching and learning. Uh, rural market town school. Uh, it was pretty teacher led. Uh, 
heavy reliance on worksheets. So I think it was uh, something that probably uh, a lot of colleagues would 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 recognise if you turned the clock back uh, ten years or more. That that was pretty much the case. Of behaviour was excellent, but the teaching and learning was fairly traditional. And then I think what happened then was in February two thousand and twelve we had a uh, an old uh, satisfactory as a, as an Ofsted grade. Uh, and uh, that really related to the teaching and learning. And I think um, at that point, uh, it then obviously provoked a whole uh, institutional kind of review of teaching and learning, where we were, uh, where we wanted to move to. And part of that uh, debate, part of that discussion was um, a sense that, you know, we like probably every school at that time, we had a certain number of fixed computer rooms and as a you know as a history teacher you you got to book into the room every so often for the odd lesson and we just felt it wasn't good enough really but it it, it wasn't and this is the key point the the ipad uh, scheme was not a bolt on in any way it wasn't a gimmick it wasn't a, 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 a you know an extra uh, it was part of that teaching learning review and it, there was a sense of the importance of, of turning every classroom into a, a computer room, not being reliant on these fixed rooms, but making every room a computer room. And not just that as well, uh, we saw a huge benefit in terms of enhancing the home learning of the students, because in our one-to-one -one scheme, the uh, the students have got the iPads, they, they take them home. It's not just something, I know there are some primary models where the students leave the iPads in the building. Uh, it wasn't one of those, this was, uh, this was a one-to-one -one iPad scheme where they, they took the iPads home and used it for home learning as well as uh, learning in the classroom. So it, we wrapped all of that up together in this teaching and learning review. Um, and we, we felt very strongly at that point that we were already into the second decade of the 21st century, but that our uh, teaching and learning practice was very recognisable back you know, to the 20th century. Um, so we felt, right, okay, we, we can do a lot better than that. We can we can really bring things forward. We felt that um, the students that we were teaching then would be working in 2050. They Some of them would be doing jobs that don't exist uh, today. They'd be, certainly be using technologies that don't exist today. So there was a strong feeling that we should put in place for them the very best of modern technology that we could get our hands on at that point. And uh, so we then conducted this kind of review of, of what technology was out there. And in our case, we, we decided uh, upon iPads. And I think a big, big sense of that was it wasn't necessarily the, uh, the cheapest option, but we felt it was the, the best option in terms of the resilience, robustness of the device, um, and uh, just the quality, the quality of the device. We felt that was really what we were after. If we were going to go through a long process, winning hearts and minds of our stakeholders, our parents and our students, then uh, the quality of the device and the robustness of it was, was a really important consideration for us. So um, I think, Tom, if we, if we just come back to the timeline in a minute, can you just yeah. flip forward to the, to the, to the next... Uh, slide so yeah, i've been very brief about the old molten way but uh moving on to the uh, to why ipads and the mobile device development i think i've talked about that uh and just one or two other things just to say in terms of moving forward um we'll go back to the timeline now tom i just wanted to <laughs> check i missed anything out in terms of moving forward we then looked at it and thought right okay well how are we going to start this because our scheme was one where as a school, well, we're working in, uh, as I said, rural North Yorkshire. So North Yorkshire is one of the lowest funded authorities and we were a below average size 11 to 18 school. So our funding levels weren't great, but we made a commitment to fund um, uh, infrastructure costs. Uh, and we made, a, 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 I think, a brave move at the time, which was to subsidize the first uh, wave of iPads and run it as a almost like action research, really. Yeah. Uh, so that it was, a, we ran it as a loss leader. 
to that first wave of students and action research for us. So that first wave to year 12 was heavily subsidized. We chose year 12. We chose the sixth form deliberately because um, our most of our, the majority of our sixth formers go on to uh, further or higher education. Uh, and we felt that independent learning, which was a big thrust of our teaching and learning review, uh, was initially most applicable post-16. Um, it was also a question of scale because we were looking to uh, run it as a lost leader and to win hearts and minds. So scale was important. Our sixth form was obviously smaller than our main school year groups. So that was a consideration too. Um, so we ran it on a heavy subsidy in that first year. And then uh, we ran lots of meetings, lots of engagement meetings with parents and students in which we uh, not only dealt with it from a financial angle. So the, the gist of the, 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 the gist of the arrangement is that the, the parents were paying a, a, a monthly amount. Uh, the iPad remains the property of the school until the end of the period, which was something like 28 months to start with uh, or 24 months with the, with the sixth form. And um, uh, only at the end of that period, then the iPad became the property of the parent. But we, we tried to sell it on the basis of, of uh, we were offering a very good deal. Uh, and that was partly through yourselves. So we were offering a very good deal. We were also going to engage with parents and say, well, look, in terms of safe internet use and how to make the most uh, value out of the internet, as a school, we feel we should engage with you as, as yeah. parents. We shouldn't just leave you uh, in that fight on your own because if we ignored modern technology, well, then, you know, in most cases, in many cases, parents would be buying their children either, a, uh, you know, a smartphone or a device of some kind. So we felt we should engage with them in terms of educating the children into what sensible internet use would be. Uh, and we also uh, sold it on the basis of how we would then use it in terms of teaching and learning. So the power it gives to a teacher in the knowledge that every child in their, in their class has got a device with the same capabilities uh, is massive over some kind of ad hoc system where you say, well, if you've got a device, you can get it out and use it, but each one is different. The power of everyone having the same device uh, was really quite significant. So we, I, I think it took probably two, two years through to September 14 to win over the, the community. Yeah. Uh, and as you can see there, September 14, uh, we went full price. And then in February 15, we went out to Key Stage 4. So we started Key Stage 5, then went to Key Stage 4. Uh, and then by February 16, we, we got to Key Stage 3, and it was a one-to-one -one, uh, yeah. scheme. So we're now, you know, four years into our one-to-one -one, one -one scheme. So I might have mentioned there, Rob, that the um, deployment in 2016 to Year 9, the first one in Key Stage and three, we actually achieved 100% of the student engagement and participation in the scheme, which obviously is a, a measure of how successful our stakeholder engagement had been prior to that. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I was going to just actually ask, ask on that as a, a few things, um, uh, two things I, I would say. The first thing is obviously in, in the audience, we, there is a chat feature window. So if you feel you've got questions that um, would be appropriate and you want us to, to answer them as we go along uh, because there'll be some great stuff that comes out here. We're happy to do that. But just, just on the, the initial bit that you were talking about, um, I guess not just Rob, but the team, is I think I think what, what's quite mind-blowing looking back on this, even for me who's been, you know, not involved in this journey but been involved in the industry for a long time, to, to go down a project where as a school you were essentially investing a lot of your funding to, 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 and I don't, it's not a gamble, but to, to essentially take ownership of the funding in the first few years is, is a pretty big step. And, and my, my question would be, I wonder, you know, with funding not being any better than it was in 2010, essentially for schools, um, and the fact that you've got such a successful project now is, 
um, it was a big fight, I guess, around the engagement in terms of making sure that people were engaged and understood your reasoning to why you wanted to go down this journey to, mm. to having a full, you know, deployment. Mm. Do you do you think, looking back on that now, that you maybe would have still done things differently, or are you are you ultimately happy with the overall journey that you had in those first couple of years? Well, I think it's I think it's really important to win hearts and minds. You've got to put a big investment into that. Uh, if I was to do anything differently, it would only be to 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 try to uh, to speed it up a little bit. But I do think it's really important to win to win hearts and minds, and I think that's paid off for us now in the in the current situation, which I know you want us to come on to later. Uh, the the fact that we uh, have managed to carry our community uh, of staff and students and parents with us has massively advantaged us uh, when we moved into lockdown in March. So we'll come on to that later on. But yeah, uh, that engagement is is it's key. Is key. And I think and I think it's it's what it's all. I mean, um, it's probably worth just uh, Helen. I know from a, a, a CPD perspective, maybe. You know, the engagement isn't just in supporting your students, but also the engagement of, of staff. Um, would you say that there was um, there was some engagement wins that needed to be done from a staff perspective in those first few years, or was it kind of everyone was was on board? Yeah, definitely. Um, every member of staff has kind of come along at their own pace. It's not been um, whilst we've advised and we've recommended that staff use the devices at no point did we in the early days say that the device has to be used in every single lesson for as much as you can it was a gradual building the staff's digital resilience ensuring that they were supported in every step of the way and that could have been from um, a colleague being in a classroom supporting them actually using an app and using the device um, yeah. to training after school so it's, it's building that digital resilience in staff has meant that their confidence has improved and they can take the students with them we're in the day and age where a lot of the students are, are more technology um, aware than the staff members to start with so we we really did have to to build staff's um resistant re digital resilience yeah and can I just come in on, on, on that point that one of the decisions we made early on was to, I mean, there are so many apps out there, so many sort of useful things that you can do. You have to be selective. Yeah. Uh, and I think we, the Helen and her lead practitioner team did a lot of work early on to sort of analyze pros and cons of various apps that we could use. Uh, um, but we just chose a small number and then, and, and then, really focused on them and work and uh, so Shobi is probably the biggest single example where we just took took one app and then got everybody using it got everybody using it well uh providing audio feedback for example to the six formers in those first couple of years you know audio feedback on an a-level essay in real time the win for the teachers teacher workload um but but one one piece of advice I would say to anybody is uh, don't try to do everything that you can do. Uh, you know, pick the things that you want to do and and get everybody doing it and, and understanding it and seeing the benefits before you then move on to pick something else. And, and I know that we'll we'll touch on this later, but somebody's um, raised a question around, um, you know, you, you were in a, in a really strong position by 2015 and, and the launch of Apple Pencil essentially, um, it, you know, around that time, um, it was a, you know, is a consideration, but I know it's something that you'll touch on later, but you, you talk about, I said, you know, I guess, little, you know, doing, doing, do, do less, do it well is one of our mantras, I guess, that we talk about, but it's really about um, making sure that everyone is there is a baseline level, um, and then how do you how do you maximise the opportunity uh, of the device that you do have? So it's not always about replacing everything, but you talk about feedback, um, verbal feedback. As part of that journey, you're considering other methods of feedback through maybe digital linking through Apple Pencil. Is that kind of maybe one of the things that we'll talk about later? Yeah, that's definitely one of the, the next steps that we're working towards. The, the video feedback and the verbal feedback is um, 
as Rob said, is something that we need to, when we've continued to work on getting right. So some of our CPD training has been staff using um, one of the core apps that we've got, things like Explain Everything, and yes. it might be enhanced video feedback. So it's not just the digital annotations on the students' work within Shobi. They may have a bespoke video that they can watch back that it's even got examples in and um, example mark schemes and things as well. Yeah. So it, it's really progressing and fine tuning what we've got um, before we then take the step forwards. And I, th I think the um, the other the other thing that that was of interest, it's kind of a, a question that popped up is, you know, when you take the the initiative to to fund a lot of the initial, you know, the first two years with the funding around the devices. Obviously, one of those conversations you probably had to have internally was around internal infrastructure and, and not only internal infrastructure and Wi-Fi, but obviously the access for students at home. But, but, but was there much work required from your perspective um, in terms of improving the infrastructure internally? And then from that, how do you, how do, you do the funding piece on both elements? I guess, Alex, it might be, I don't know if that's for you or... Yeah. Um, the uh, obviously every school has broadband, so we we accepted that the existence of an iPad for Learning scheme was going to significantly improve increase the um, the broadband requirement of the school. Um, there was an increased cost in that in the early days, um, but I would say our, our broadband cost today is about a quarter of what it was at the start of this project, despite our connection speed being almost four or five times what it was. Yeah. Um, Wi-Fi is the big, the big make or break. You must make sure your Wi-Fi is absolutely resilient as part of your infrastructure considerations. But also wider um, infrastructure things like um, use of the MDMs to manage not behaviour to a certain extent, but um, the use of ensuring students have got the correct apps in place and you know even just device tracking to a certain extent. Um, but certainly the additional infrastructure considerations much wider, like um, safeguarding for students at home have to be considered and your um how you uh, maintain your security for your vulnerable students when yeah. they're off site as well right, is a huge part of, of the considerations you have to make yeah um, and obviously along with the infrastructure comes the managed apple id infrastructure yeah that, that goes in and supports all that for you and I, and I think just on that alex i know that when we, we we've been up um and had meetings and 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 we've talked about not even just the infrastructure in terms of, an, of the wireless or, or or the network it's also what is the what does the classroom look like in terms of displays and how do, how do teachers use um larger displays because you know what's what's funny is uh, you know you did a lot of due diligence you you obviously looked at other devices you 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 decided that ipad for whatever reason um, which you're describing is is has been the right solution, and we we know that because of the history that's happened. Um, but you know, ten years ago, the the government talked about why you know interactive whiteboards would be a great purchase. But last summer, we're very open to say actually, you know, unless they're being used, maybe they're not the right tool for school uh, for schools. Um, and um, the other the other cost that you talked about, Alex, in terms of MDM, is also the managed apps. And there are some apps that are free, um, but there are also apps that are um, are not. And we talk about um, you know the Apple School Manager console from a management perspective with alongside MDM. Um, somebody's asked about Apple Classroom. Is that, I know that we we've talked about the iTunes U and school work and so on, but Apple Classroom is a really powerful management tool in terms of in a classroom environment. And are you using that? Um, happily now, and is that that going well? Do you want to cover this, Helen? <laughs> um, Apple Classroom, we've had a, a bit of a mixed success with because we've got a mixed state, um, a mixed state of devices. Yeah. We have used it really successfully um, to, to kind of monitor what students are doing. So, for example, you might have the pastoral team walking down the corridor during a lesson to actually check that students are working yeah. um, and doing what they're supposed to be. But we haven't explored the functionality beyond that at present yeah. due to the mixed state of devices. Okay. Can so I that, and that, um, can I just come in on on you know what you, you, your last question was in several parts almost and the, yep. Yep. the very first part was sort of back, back on the finance and 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 the and the and the risk as you put it uh, taken on on uh, on starting this off and i just want to say that you know any school 
uh, any head, you've got to make choices. And and the big picture bit for us was that we have, well, it's a, it's two old buildings. It's a split site school, one from 1911, one from 1958. And, you know, the capital money is just not there to make the improvements to the buildings that you might ideally want to make so yeah. then you think right well we can't get the buildings we want it's just not possible so but a school is about people it's about interactions between people staff and students and it's about and we can have the very best of modern technology in even in very old building stock which is not ideal yeah um far from ideal but you know but and and that was a big picture choice to, to inform this, we you know we weren't going to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves or lament what we couldn't have. We were going to make a choice with the funding we did have to yeah. crack on and deliver something that was really exciting. If even in a you know even though the buildings don't look much when you when you drive up to the school, I think that's an important big picture. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and what I would say is that you know. I, from an outsider's perspective, you know, when we come up to Moulton, it's still it's still a school and it still looks like a school. And you absolutely you're right. It's about the people. It's about the environment. You know, you get that that you absolutely get that feeling. I think I think it's an interesting. The reason I asked the question is, you know, obviously I spend a lot of time talking to leadership teams, and 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 one of those the, the easiest response to you know how do we move forward with technology when we don't have the funds to do it? And I think what's interesting is. You know the funds have always been tight, and what you've been able to achieve is 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 phenomenal. And the journey that you've been able to uh, essentially, uh, you know, pave for your students is incredible. Um, and I think just people are really, you know, I'm quite happy to ask these questions. But I think that actually, I think you know, we've always said it takes a very broad set of shoulders to go down a journey with mobile technology because there are so many considerations. And I think the key thing is. As you you've suggested, Rob, it's 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 you know as a head you have to make decisions, but you're relying heavily on your on your team. Generally, uh, as a head teacher, everyone um, you, you know has opinions, and it's about you know having that information that you can make best informed decisions. Um, and you know we often talk to our customers about the experience that you guys have been down because we know um, that that decisions tough decisions have to be made um and you know we've 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 got a case study video with you that we we've have we've have on our website and it talks about that journey um and i just i'm just you know from our perspective i i wonder whether people would be able to do what you're able to do back in 2012 do that now to to be able to fund and ask for a contribution you know essentially of 25 pound per head to in a position where you know, in some institutions now, the funding comes from a parent um, provision fully, like yours, um, whichever means that is. Um, but it's 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 that's I guess the funding bit is one bit, but the the, the key element is to getting everyone on board and understanding you know yeah. why they're investing in in this scheme. Uh, I worked on a, a project in Plymouth where you know the socio-economic climate is really um, really hard. And what we found when we were engaging with, with with the parents was actually that there was never a question in doubt around wanting to be involved in the project, but it's how how did they fund it so that they could they could access those devices. Um, and I think that's that's one of the key elements. The other the other key element that I, I just want to touch on finally, we talked about apps, um, Helen, or well, you talked about apps briefly, but one of the things that we've been working on with you, kind of um, in more recent times, is um, we talk about um, the Apple Distinguished School Program, which is um, a program that Apple have got to recognize um, schools that are doing great things specifically with Apple devices. And as part of that is, is being able to showcase workflow. And we've been talking uh, about how we can elevate um, your next steps in the use of iPad and what, what, you know, it's not always about necessarily buying the latest and greatest iPad, um, but actually the workflow for your students, especially now, one of the things that we're seeing is that the success um, from um, schools that are, uh, are remote learning is having been able to transition from the classroom to a remote environment. And I know that you use um, Office 365 uh, as part of that. You, know, you talked about Shobi. Um, how how was the workflow? Has the workflow changed hugely? 
uh, pre-COVID to to now, was as the use of cloud computing impacted that, you know, positively. We've had quite a seamless transition into remote learning because we've got all of the systems and routines in place already. Yeah. So we found that through the use of Shobi, staff and students are able to easily interact. We've got lessons being set following the normal school timetable. We're continuing with the normal school curriculum. So the systems that we've got in place, the routines have actually really, really enhanced um, and helped students during this um, period of remote learning. So. Yeah. In thinking about things like it's not just the member of staff that's actually working in Shobi, you've also got a teaching assistant sat in that Shobi class as well. So a teaching assistant that would normally support a student in the classroom is still able to do that remotely. And that could be by um, adding in sentence starters for something to help them. It could be some positive um, encouragement. It could be a voice note. But that member of staff and those two members of staff are still able to work alongside each other in the classroom. Um, and that's really, really beneficial to the students when they're at home. So they're not sat struggling, working remotely, perhaps with parents who can or can't support them. So they're not as advantaged um, by working remotely. And, and in terms of planning, then you said the transition was quite easy. But is there has there been any real sticking points or is any things that have been a real conversation for you? Well, can, just to just to say, uh, Tom, I think it's impo important that, uh, in terms of that. It was the 16th of March, was the week where we knew that last week we knew we were heading into lockdown. And one of the things we had to do was we knew that we were one to one iPads, but we knew we had, like we always do, some iPads that were broken or weren't working. So Alex, in that last week, uh, with his uh, technician, managed to fix every single iPad that was uh, that needed fixing. And we we contacted all parents to check about internet access at home. And the vast majority had it. We had a small number that, that, that didn't. And we went out and sourced uh, Wi-Fi dongles and took Wi-Fi dongles out to the families that didn't have it. So that when we left the building on the 20th of March, the Friday, we knew that we had 100% iPad and 100% internet coverage. So on Monday, the 23rd of March, uh, lesson started as normal. The kids had to get up and register at 8.45 for lesson one. Uh, and what we said to the staff team was, we want you to make 15 minutes of input at the start of a lesson. And that might be a video podcast or an audio, or it might be uh, a PowerPoint or some other kind of input at the start, new material. As mm -hmm. Helen has said, conscious decision to carry on with the curriculum. We, I know that some schools made the decision to uh, do consolidation work, but I think we felt that, that this was going to be going on for quite a long time and so we needed to carry on with the curriculum delivery um, and then uh, the students have to upload by 7 p.m. in the evening the work uh, and staff uh, uh, go on and check after seven o'clock in the evening and then the parents the next day get an automated email from Bromcom which is our MIS system yeah we'll tell them you know, if their son or daughter hasn't done all of the work from the previous day, it'll tell them. Uh, or if they've done it really well or excellently, they'll get an e-certificate uh, saying how well they've done, which will bring house points with it. So that system has been up and running, um, uh, and we, we literally switched to it on day one. Now, we were only able to do that because we've had this seven-year journey up to this point, and, and, and got to the stage we're in but we were able to actually just make that switch and continue curriculum delivery from day one of the uh, of the lockdown. And supporting that as well, we've had um, the continued support of staff. So as Rob said about having the input at the start, we may genuinely have had some newer colleagues or some colleagues who perhaps haven't engaged quite as well with the video creation. So we've been able to utilize Microsoft Teams to um, have a bank of resources and how to and help guides sat there for staff so that they continue to build their digital resilience. We've yeah. got staff at the moment still um, working through Microsoft accreditation and how to use Teams more effectively and how to use um, OneNote. So we've still got the students who are learning, um, but we've got the staff still continuing their professional development as well while they're at home. Mm. And, and I think just, just on that message that, that you've you know both kind of highlighted there is, I think one of the one of the strengths that we've certainly seen over the last few years is, you know, DfE have been talking around the use of cloud computing since, you know, 2015. 
Um, but the reality is, you know, as academia, we use Office 365 as our backbone. I, I use my iPad uh, as I am doing now, you know, 100% of the time. And the apps for Microsoft um, work fantastically well um, on iPad, and, and it's a great solution. Um, and I think that's, for me, when we talk about the elevation of what do we do next, as, as you said, when we talk around um, being able to launch essentially that Monday going, you know, going back to school as normal. Um, would you say that the the ability for maybe collaboration or communication and feedback has, has been continued? I know it's a tough, maybe a tough question to answer, but all your students were registering at 8.45 on that, on that Monday. Are they all registering now? Well, <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, sit here and say that every single student has been turning up for every single lesson. OK, so we know that we know that some students um, are doing less than others. Uh, yeah. But but the parents find that out the, the very next day, the next morning they get up, they've got an automated email. So, you know, in terms of that engagement with the parents, it, you know, it, it's that that is complete. And they, they're either getting the praise or they're getting the notice that the child hasn't finished it all. And I think it's not, and it's, and it wasn't at all to pinpoint anything, Rob. But what the reason I asked that question is, as uh, with another, um, I was on another webinar and we were talking around um, expectation uh, and emotion, or the, the the fine line between expectation and emotion. You know, I've, I'm a parent of a of an 11 year old and a 17 year old. Um, and I would say that in the first few weeks, uh, my 11-year-old, year six, he was doing English and maths in the morning, doing it in the afternoon. Um, we weren't quite giving him a packed lunch at lunchtime, but there was a real kind of structure to the day. We're in a point now where he still is doing that quantity of work, but we he's given himself much more responsibility in choosing when in the day he does that. As long as it's done, and as you've said, you know, uh, sometimes it will happen in the morning, sometimes it will happen in the afternoon, depending on what he wants to do. Um, but we've certainly seen him take more responsibility in the, the uh, I wouldn't say it's project-based learning, but he's he's taking responsibility for him, himself doing the workload for that day at a time that probably is more convenient to him. And I know that that's about skill set development and everything else, um, but it's an interesting debate and topic. And one of the things that we've seen um, arise on is how do we, how do we replicate teaching with the board behind us in a classroom to suddenly doing it online? And is the answer to be on a video conference call with your students, or is it about making sure that the, the support and content they need is available and that the feedback is available, but ultimately they're doing that, that work um, as appropriate? Well, what, I, what I'll say, I'll, if I say something first, if Helen, if you want to chip in, please yeah, do. Uh, I think, I think it's an important point that that I mean it's great what you know the materials that Oak have produced and that the BBC have produced and so on it's fantastic, but what 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 we've got is the normal teacher of that class delivering the ongoing curriculum content for that class, having knowing those students. Yeah, and, and that is really that's a really significant point. They're not they're not setting sort of uh, ongoing um, project work to be done by the end of the half term or something like that, which I know from my experience, uh, my, 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 I've still got my two youngest still of school age, um, is, is, a, is a real mental health stress and concern. The structure, the routine of, of the day and the delivery of lessons and the feedback from the normal teacher uh, is really important. What I would say is I do agree with your point. I think it's leading us on to maybe onto the next slide in a moment, but yeah. I do agree with your point, which is that um, uh, if you have the same of anything for an extended period of time, it will become boring potentially for anybody. So I think we, we are, along with many schools, have not allowed live learning, live lessons, uh, to happen yet for various safeguarding concerns, but one of our one of our sort of considerations moving forward uh, in June and July and beyond is how what protocols can we put in place? And we're looking at this with 
the Red Kite Teaching School Alliance that we're members of and and uh, with North Yorkshire as a local authority. What safeguarding provisions and protocols can we put in place to remove some of those concerns about the delivery of live lessons? Because yeah. I do think that that would be a further enhancement and a further yeah. step that we do need to take. And Helen, I don't know if you want to add anything to any of that. No, I think just we were talking about the students' well-being um, and about variety and engagement. I think the fact that we've got those iPads as devices, I've certainly seen that myself as a parent of two students in the school, is mm. that you can have a PE lesson where they might be doing a Joe Wicks workout, which loads of other students in the country are doing. But they've then got another activity that they're, you know, I, I'm being requested to go outside and film them um, throwing a cricket ball at some cricket stumps or flipping a tea bag into a mug. There's all sorts of different activities that are being created and are just kind of encouraging the students and just keeping them motivated. Some of the art projects continuing with students having some of the resources at home or being able to do things digitally. So mm. the, the iPads have really given the students that variety as well. Um, and things like you know the well-being for students, we've got an in-school mentor who's producing weekly podcasts and that's being put on a YouTube channel and students can access that. We've got the pastoral team, the students have got an email contact. They know that that pastoral member of staff that they may have had regular contact with before is just there at the end of an email. Um, mm. And if needs be, you know, that can be transferred to a telephone conversation later on. So I think our students are really, really well supported. And I think they have had a huge variety in the activities that have been set. And they've certainly benefited from the iPads as learning tools in that sense. And, and fantastic. And I guess one of the, just before we go on to what your your new normal looks like, we've talked about the support from teachers, but the, the kind of the work that week before you kind of had to, to, to leave school, um, there was a lot of work from Alex and his team. But how's, have, has there been um, much need for support outside of that since then, Alex? I mean, is, is, how have you been able to do that? Um, because for the schools we mind open for the key worker children, we have been able to, where there's been technical difficulties, um, swap devices out from our loan pool. We were in a really strong position going into the lockdown that we had managed to get every student with their original device in full working order, as Rob previously pointed out. Yeah. The result of that means there is a pool of, of spare devices that we have in school. And obviously, as part of daily exercise and other conditions, people are able to come and collect those if necessary. Yeah. Um, some of those th uh, devices have then come back in and, and subsequently been repaired and, and gone back out again. Um, there is, with any kind of portable device, a, a continuous overhead of wear and tear and breakage and technical yeah. difficulties. Can I, and just to chip in on that, we've been selling, we've been selling power cables for a pound. When uh, you know, in our in our rural area, somebody might have been having to drive all the way to Scarborough and pay a lot more than a pound to get yeah. a whole power cable. So you know, it's it's just little things like that to to try and keep everything going. Absolutely, and and that's that's exactly you know, I mean, this is this going back to the things that we need to think about. That, you know, these sort of sort of things maybe that we we don't always think about the initial bits. It's how do we deal with them. Um, kind of further down the line and I guess um, I know we've touched on on the consideration around the the student and teacher interaction a little bit already but going forwards we talk about you know um, I mean one of the announcements in the news um, yesterday and today and some universities in the UK have already made the announcement that um, you know face-to-face -face, um, lectures and tutoring will not continue uh, or will not happen until September 2021 um, what do you think your your school? I mean, I know there's lots of talk around um, what might happen from a government perspective, but what might your lessons look like going forwards at the moment? Well, uh, of course, we should just say that you know universities are more independent than than we are in the secondary yeah. sector. So, you know, to some extent, we will be we will be delivering uh, our part of the national response as directed by the government so i should say that to start with but yeah. i think i think people are increasingly aware that you know we went for a period of time didn't we where everyone was looking forward to september as if september was going to be some panacea yeah. and it's clearly not going to be and we don't know we don't know yet what september will be like but it won't be uh, as it was uh you know, the week beginning the 16th of March. It, it just won't be the same as that. So, um, uh, 
I think it just shows to me even more the case that um, you know a, a one-to-one solution is deliverable. This would be a key message from me. It is deliverable in uh, in any uh, secondary setting. Uh, I, I can tell you that you know our our budget was very tight, as I said at the start. Very we're relatively low funded local authority. You know, it's about choices. You know, if, if you are if you see it as a vision for your teaching, learning, and where you want it to go, uh, and you engage with with your community, you you can get there. And I just think uh, the the further development of of it is is going to be very uh, key. I think for yeah. all, for all schools. I mean, on a personal note, we're looking for us. We're looking at. Uh, changing our scheme maybe alex will chip in on this but we're looking at changing our scheme to move towards um uh uh a, a more of a complete package with a, a keyboard and an apple pencil um uh, and we see that as a as a next stage of our our development uh, alex i don't know if you want to say anything on that uh, yeah i mean i just touch on the comment in the little comment section there in the chat about the Apple Pencil being useful and we picked up an Apple Pencil being a really useful tool but unfortunately in 2015 when it was launched it was only on the Pro models. As part of our engagement with stakeholders and parents we felt we couldn't justify the move to a, a Pro device for the additional features that Pencil's given obviously the the apple pencil became a, a little bit more of a consumer level product in 2018 when the sixth generation ipad came out with with pencil support yeah, yeah. this is absolutely you know we're absolutely looking at this as the next step so for any student joining our school in september this year we'll have the um the new logitech magic folio keyboard cases with the touch pads and an apple pencil yeah just, you know just to you know, it's it's the the next step. We focused on the use of iPad for um, you know accessing resources online and and the formative feedback that was was a real pivotal to our development as a school over the previous years. The next step is is trying to you know add even more value with these additional tools such as the Apple Pencil, which is now affordable. But as part of that, maintaining a, a financially viable scheme, we had to look at our scheme where we used to be on a, a two 28-month models in a school life. We're actually now looking at two 40-month models uh, and the mm. scheme right through into the sixth form. And that's very much because we acknowledge that the additional um, accessory costs with the keyboard cases and the Apple Pencils drives up the cost of the devices. It drives up the cost of the insurance. So to, again, to try and make that affordable, we, we've we've drawn out the length of the scheme uh, by an additional uh, an additional twelve months. Yeah, which then yeah. means the actual monthly payments for someone who was in the scheme two years ago is the same as what it will be under the new scheme. But it's that big leap forward. You know, Apple are pushing it on all their TV adverts. You know, it's it's the Apple Pencil and the cases with the with the Magic Trackpads has made your iPad that step nearer to a, a laptop so it returns all those mm. portable functionalities but it's made that big leap towards becoming a, a, a more of a desktop device as well and H helen helen do you want to come in on the teaching and learning angle there just to just to finish off what alex was saying about about that i mean i i, I know that i've i've seen some some students have already using apple pencils in uh, lower school art classes just the quality of the artwork uh, is, is amazing. But Helen, do you want to chip in on the teaching and learning side? Yeah, so in terms of digital inking, that's going to be the next um, phase of our CPD for staff. And that's something that we've been working on with our ADE, which we've had at every stage of this journey um, since we started uh, provided by academia. So it's going to be um, a case of making sure that we're getting the best um, usage out of those devices and that staff are as proficient at digital linking as students. Mm -hmm. So again, that for us is the next step and it's thinking about how we're going to do that if we're still in this kind of remote situation. We have to make sure that those students coming in in September are skilled and are using the new um, accessories, but also the staff are and the staff are driving that. So yeah. um, 
And yeah. and I think I think also from just going back to what you mentioned, Alex, that you know when the Apple Pencil first came out and it, you know the models it was available for, and you know I think since then you talked about the Logitech um, you know keyboards specifically. Um, just recently launched the Logitech Combo Touch, which which is has been made actually in conjunction um, with Apple. So it's it's also not using Bluetooth; it's using the smart connectors, which are now built into those um, entry level devices. Um, the other big I guess change that's happened, um, which is not a hardware thing, is that the way that the software um, on iPads has, has massively um, been developed and changed. And the mm -hmm. use of um, even a, a third party mouse now, a Bluetooth mouse, um, is, is feasible through iPad OS. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that um, the, the ability if students are, have a, you know, do they need to have a keyboard or a, a, pay, a, a crayon um, from Logitech or an Apple Pencil? The answer is probably not. Um, if they want it, though, it's absolutely there to, for them to be able to use. Um, and as you said, you know, uh, Rob, art, art departments are certainly seeing an uplift in the use of digital linking and, and what that can can do. Um, and I would say, um, you know, Desi, Desi asked the question um, from Ireland, um, you know, what do, do you have any students that maybe don't have a keyboard case but are using a Bluetooth keyboard, for example? I mean, are you seeing that as a as a use? Yeah, definitely. We've certainly got some more students who um, might have exam considerations. Um, so perhaps would have routinely had a scribe or would have had additional time in an exam. Yeah. Some of those students, their their normal method of working is with a wireless keyboard in the okay. classroom on their iPad so that they don't lose all of the screen while they're typing. And that yeah. then helps them to improve their typing speed and proficiency so that when they come to sit their external exams, be at the end of year 12, end of year 11, sorry, end of year 13 or end of year 11, they're, they're just used to typing. That is their normal method of yeah. working. Um, all of their work often stored on OneNote electronically. Some students not even having exercise books, still doing all of the green pen improvement on their work um, through OneNote and teachers able to see that and comment and um, provide feedback. So we certainly have already got students doing that. And I think yeah. seeing students like that in the classroom and just seeing how that enhances their learning and thinking, well, actually, that definitely is the next step because mm. it's going to make such a difference to other students. Yeah. And I guess uh, probably a, a you know a bit bit borderline question. Um, one of the things that I'm quite passionate about in the classroom is, um, you know, why why do we still have teachers still needing to be at the front of the class? I think when we chatted the other day, Helen, you mentioned about the interaction. You kind of you are still missing with your students and and seeing them. Um, but one of the flexibilities you've had is being able to move around the classroom. Um, but we still, as Rob mentioned at the beginning, we live in this this world of instant gratification where you can access pretty much anything you want very quickly, yet we're still teaching or having to follow guidelines and, and frameworks that are probably not as current as we want them to be. So my question is, you know, with the use of digital technology and mobile learning, where do we think exams might need to be? And I know that you might have an official response, Rob, but also unofficially it's an own, it's an opinion thing isn't it well yeah uh, so on a personal uh, opinion just expressing this myself now but i think w when we've had debates about exams in recent years they've been very they've been very structural debates about for example uh, uh, should we continue with a levels or should we have uh, more vocational uh, exams and so on and i wonder sometimes if we're asking the right questions in those debates um, uh, and whether in fact we should be looking at um, uh, moving away from paper-based exams. I mean, it just we didn't mention it earlier, but we've made huge savings in some respects. I mean, photocopying and and so on, huge cost reductions. Ex expand that. I mean, every school in the land is paying a fortune to the exam boards for the examination process, and a lot of that money is going on on chopping down forests and uh, ch churning out huge numbers of paper documents and then putting it on lorries and sending it all around the country into lockable exam rooms. I mean, it, if you want if you want an example of how 20th century something is, I mean, that's just the whole exam process is 20th century with maybe with the recent addition of, uh, of, of sort of uh, papers being scanned and shared between markers. But I mean, essentially, it's the 20th century system. Yeah. You know, I'm not the right person to answer this question, but I do think that we should be looking at um, 
uh, examinations online, uh, uh, electronic exams, and different kinds of exams that may be uh, test, uh, uh, you know, what students know and can do in a more open-ended way so we don't have to have tiering. Everyone can start and then progress through to a level in an electronic exam. Uh, I, to me, that seems a lot, a lot fairer than still... Uh, one or two ex subjects where we do have tiering, which doesn't seem right to me. So I think there's a lot to be looked at, but I wonder if we ask the right questions. I don't think any of us do. We, if we think about Star Trek or Star Wars or Buck Rogers in the 25th century, we don't think of anybody getting a note, you know, say, oh, that's a good point. I'll just get my pen out and I'll just uh, jot that down in my notebook. You know, and yet we seem held back uh, by, by the examination system. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that goes back to what we said at the beginning, right, is it takes a broad set of shoulders to, to do a journey. But I think I think there is a massive and again, this is a personal opinion. I think there is a massive fear of, you know, um, of change generally. I think that's why a lot of these sorts of things get get blocked. Um, and the response to that is if we're always going to do what we've always done, then I guess we'll always get the same results. And And I think probably more so than ever, we're in a position right now, unfortunately because of COVID, where we can make a massive change to the way the education system um, flows and, and, and the guidelines. And, and really we need some, some bold decisions absolutely to be made. And I don't think that's a, an unfair thing to say. I think, yes, is it being driven by, by the, the situation? Absolutely. But then if you don't have that situation, then you'll never, you'll never make those changes. And I think, you know, we've talked really already about the future plans and changes to, um, you know, your accessories and so on. Um, and I think, I guess, from that perspective, looking at time, we're, we're, we're dead on sort of five o'clock. Um, it would be really interesting to know if there are any other people who have um, any other questions. Um, and whilst people are asking uh, those questions in the chat, um, I would just um, probably like to say, um, you know, is there anything else you want to add before I, I thank you for your time? Well, I'd just add in uh, briefly that um, uh, one of the things that we've just started this year uh, is is delivery of the Everyone Can Create series. So we haven't talked about um, collaboration, um, but I mean, that's obviously a big thing moving, moving forward. Um, and uh, we, we, we deliver an extra hour on a Thursday, which is our personal development time. And uh, it's all entirely skills based. <laughs> Within that, it's allowed us to begin the delivery of, of, the, of the Everyone Can Create series. Yeah. So I think, I think that's uh, part of our future direction of travel is uh, equipping the students to collaborate more together. Yeah. Uh, uh, Helen, do you want to add anything on that? No, I, don't, I think no. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think just what I what I would add, um, just jump in if unless Alex has got anything to say, is one of the things that we've been really um, been able to do as a, as a as a support mechanism and a partner to you guys is to offer a lot of Apple professional learning through the use of um, James Hannum, who's an Apple professional learning specialist. But there's there's a there's, I know Desi, who's on the on here, is also um, uh, you know. Um, a part of that um, kind of cohort of trainers. Um, but but it's actually also one of the real key successes from our perspective as well is being able to support not just from a hardware perspective, but actually is that longer term journey through the, the CPD and working with you guys. So first of all, thank you um, hugely for, for being able to be part of the journey um, to date. We, we absolutely um, you know feel that's a huge privilege um, to be part of that relationship. Also, um, for being able to attend today. I know that your time is hugely busy. Um, there is a question, Alex, for you um, uh, from Desi around the MDM you're using, I'm guessing um, you're currently using Lightspeed, is that right? Yeah, it's Lightspeed, yeah. But you are also potentially looking at alternatives based on potential future products, I guess, or? Yeah, that, yeah, it's something we monitor all the time. Um, we don't harness the power of the, like, the MDM as much as we could, and it, it does only represent a tiny proportion of the overall cost. So, but I do constantly review, and to me, the, the light speed is really still one of the few real education focused MDMs, you know, simple yeah. things like um, 
on campus off campus policy so we've always got a, a provision where we say the parents are paying for these devices so if they wish the device should act just like a device behaves if you bought it from Curry's. Yeah. But when it comes into school, we want to prescribe how that device behaves. And the MDM allows us to do that. And other things, you know, from a safeguarding perspective, the MDM helps us out there with some, you know, safeguarding features yeah. like global proxies and filtering and and we've also got like auditing on the email system provided as a separate part of not linked to the MDM. Mm. Don't buy from Curry's by the way. Um that just, <laughs> just it's just a knowledge to uh, more to say what a device you know the idea that a device if a parent wanted it to could yeah no I, I, know, that. I, know. I think I the think flip side of the MDM is we also allows us to um if parents are having problems at home behaviorally we can extend out the use of the MDM yeah. into the home as well yeah yeah and I think that's really important and I think safeguarding is a key topic just lastly on that, I think just there are about 180 MDMs on the market, of which there are literally a handful that we should have any consider in education. Um, so I hope that answers your question, um, Bessie. But again, thank you um, very much for your time, Rob. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay. At this point, we will um, leave um, the, I guess, the webinar. We'll, well, we'll turn off our, our webcam and microphone. There will be some music. And if there's any more questions, um, we will be more than happy uh, to answer those. So thank you guys. It's been great and speak to you soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.